Thank you for joining the San Jose Museum of Art. I'm Paulina Vu, Manager of Museum Experience and today's program producer. Originally slated to be on site, we we're appreciative of our guest speakers to pivot and participate in the program as a museum from home session. We'd also like to thank the many of you who are joining us, our Bay Area neighbors and friends from as far and wide as Southern California and the East Coast. And also a hello to Mr. Rizzio's sixth grade students. A few quick notes before we begin. Our program is approximately 45 minutes and will include a Q&A at the end. If you'd like to submit a question, please scroll to the bottom of your screen to where you see the Q&A feature to do so. Welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Catherine Wade, curator of the exhibition Biorhythm for today's gallery talk on Sonia Rappaport. Thank you, Paulina, and welcome to SJMA's Museum from Home gallery talk for Sonia Rappaport Biorhythm, the exhibition that opened in February at the museum. I'm Catherine Wade, the exhibition curator, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Ala Efimova and Terry Kahn, who are advisors to the Sonia Rappaport Legacy Trust. The Trust has so constructively supported the research and organization of this exhibition. In lieu of being in the gallery today, I'm going to walk you through the thinking behind the show, highlighting a few works. Then Ala and Terry will take us more in depth to look at Sonia's multi-year performance piece, Biorhythm, which relied on collected personal data and technology-based assessment. Next slide. This exhibition is Sonia's second solo show at SJMA. Her first focused on recent paintings and drawings in 1974 when the museum was quite young. We're currently celebrating our 50th anniversary. And the current exhibition examines the extraordinary transition of Sonia's artistic practice that followed over the next decade from around 74 through 1983 when she shifted from abstract painting to making art with emerging computer technologies. Next slide. I began my research on Sonia with her yarn drawings, which are seen here on the right. She made these in the middle of that transition when the traces of her early painterly practice began to overlap with the incorporation of new technology into her work. In 1976, she was poking around the UC Berkeley math department and came across discarded computer printouts. Completely fascinated by them, she took them and began using them in her art. Uh, next slide, we see a detail of these. She stitched together the perforated edges of continuous feed paper with colorful yarn to create large canvases. On top of the computer rendered codes that were already on this recycled paper, she layered ink stamps and colorful graphite shapes that resembled those she used in earlier paintings. And here you can see this beautiful overlap between the qualities of something tactile and handmade with the digital. These are incredibly intimate and humanistic objects that recall hand stitched quilting or sewing but they begin a conversation between the coded language of computing and a personal lexicon, a symbolic language that represented female biology that Sonia had been developing and using in her paintings for years prior. Sonia was in her early 50s when she began making work on computer paper, but she had long worked with abstraction through painting. She was one of the first women to earn a master's in painting from UC Berkeley in 1949 and earned early recognition with a solo exhibition at San Francisco's Legion of Honor in 1963, where she showed paintings like this heavily impostoed canvas pink and gray that you can see here from 1958. That keen sense of color uh, that you see here in this work continued to evolve in her post painterly career, as you can see in her next slide of a large scale acrylic on canvas, which is called Beginning. This is a work that SJMA acquired from that first solo show in 1974. At the time, Sonia was using spray guns, acrylic paint, tape, pencils, and these large stencil shapes. 
as in that Y shape across the bottom of this work. These stencils of precise circles and organic forms were Sonia's own language she called Nu Shu, named after a Chinese script that was used exclusively among women. Her paintings were also borrowing, oh, here you can see those original stencils that she collected objects like a pool cue holder and a plastic anatomical model of a uterus. Um, and she collected them and stored them in a cigar box that she called Pandora's box. These found objects became symbolic of an X chromosome, a uterus, a fetus, an infant, for example, all metaphors for gender and birth, motherhood and life. Her paintings were also borrowing visual elements like the coordinate grid from found geological survey charts. This work borrowed, which was borrowed for the exhibition from Berkeley Art Museum's collection, is from 1971 and it shows Sonia overlaying graphite stencils directly onto one of those original found charts. They're interplay contrasts a kind of technological order with the artist's own personal visual system. The next slide. Visual components of these found survey charts and other representations of scientific information were figuring prominently in Sonia's large scale canvases. Next slide. Here we see a piece from 1974. And what's apparent in these works is her interest in scientific and linguistic systems and in the intera interaction of biology, technology, and the personal, which transitioned into the yarn drawings on computer printouts that she made in the following years. Next slide. So in 1977, Sonia took a computer programming course, which marked another pivotal shift in her career. Rather than relying on ambiguous data she found in the math department, computer programming allowed her to analyze information gathered from the world around her. Her visual mappings moved away from abstract representations to reflect more personal, political, and social issues, as in the four panel works seen here, and you can see a detail on um, the right there. It's a computerized study of the artist's shoes, looking at things like how many does she have? For what occasion does she wear them? Uh, the history of stylistic variations within her shoe collection. With this work, Sonia integrated autobiographical data with a very systematized process of analysis. Shortly after, in 1980, she began tracking personal data into plots and collages and through interactive computer assistant performances like Biorhythm, in which she continued to examine these linkages between coded systems and the self. Using then popular Biorhythm computers to measure one's emotional, physical, and intellectual states, she compared self-assessments of her personal state, which are seen here in the daily collages made on calendars, with a technology-based calculation. Sonia expanded the Biorhythm project to include, include data she gathered from participants in a 1983 performance at Works Gallery in San Jose. And in February, on the opening night of our exhibition at San Jose Museum of Art, the museum and the Sonia Rappaport Legacy Trust presented the first reperformance of this interactive piece. And the data gathered on participants that night is on view as part of the exhibition. Sonia's playful anticipation of the intertwining of personal data and computers with biorhythm and other projects in the 1980s is almost uncanny and certainly at the forefront of new media art practices. I'll turn it over to Terry and Ala, who will take us more deeply into this groundbreaking period of Sonia's career. Thank you, um, Catherine. And we are both grateful uh, to the museum for 
um, all the research that they did and uh, to creating this this presentation because it's really um, it's been a project that has been the least examined uh, among many of uh, Rappaport's uh, multi-year this multimedia project and um, as um, can I have that? Yes, as um, we're also very pleased that we are able to collaborate with the museum and with Sonia Rappaport Legacy Trust on uh, creating a catalog, which is the first uh, real examination of this project. And it's a fully illustrated book that will be available for online orders in um, May. Um, and uh, uh, you can pre put your name down to pre-order uh, the book to um, be um, alerted when it becomes available for orders. Um, sorry, Terry, do you um, want to uh, talk about um, your relationship with uh, Sonia Rappaport, which goes way back? It does go way back. Um, thanks, Ala. Um, I actually um, was introduced to Sonia in 2003. She gave a talk to the, um, the Art Alumni Group, which is still very active. Um, and she was definitely um, proud of her relationship to UC Berkeley. She got her MA from UC Berkeley in 1948. So she was a very early you know, female artist to, um, to go, go that track and, and get an academic degree. Um, and um, I, in, we did many things together. Um, I curated two exhibitions um, of her work, co-curated them, wrote a book about her, um, which has um, got a number of other authors. Um, but what I want to talk about actually is Sonia was um, a very, um, very proud of the projects she was working on at all times and excited about them. And I spent um, several years going to see her almost every week in her studio. I wasn't her assistant and I would go and think with her. And one of the, um, the big memories I have of that was coming into her studio um, and um, she had a ping pong table in her studio. And the ping pong table was open. It didn't have a net on it. It wasn't for playing ping pong, but she would always have whatever it was she was thinking about or working on on that table. But you did, I didn't get to just come in and see that. It was always covered with white paper. She liked to cover everything. I, I don't know if she wanted her own surprise each day when she came into her studio, but nonetheless, um, I'd be interested we would go through the protocol of having tea which she would make and we would talk and i'd kind of say so what are you working on sonia and she would we would go to the ping pong table and she would take off the paper and we would um look at what she was doing and sometimes they were just she would have just she did a lot of collage throughout her career sometimes she would just have cut up things or um it would be sort of things that were not yet formed but other times she would have works in progress and it was so interesting to see so it sort of witness her process and to hear her talk about um her work she was much more interested always in talking about the present she was forever working on um she published a lot about her work um in the catalog all i was just talking about there is actually one um, essay that was published in Leonardo magazine that she authored, which was a wonderful addition to our voices, um, sort of talking about and interpreting her work. But nonetheless, um, it was always a, a gift to have the opportunity to, to sort of be in Sonia's space, um, hearing her talk about her current work and to be part of that. And it was really an opportunity for us to think about together about that. So I got a lot of firsthand information from those experiences. Um, so, um, Sonia uh, passed away in 2015 rather suddenly, and um, a month before she passed away, uh, Terry and I, uh, she asked us for tea in her studio, um, and she was so excited to keep talking about future projects. She didn't have a diagnosis then. She had a show coming up in Oakland. She had other projects on her mind. As always, it was sort of the immediate that was uh, the just forthcoming that was of so much interest to her. So she 
uh, we were again thinking with her about uh, the future projects and then unfortunately that was the last time we, we, we saw her. Um, so after um, she passed away, um, there was um, uh, a Sonia Rappaport Legacy Trust was established and Farley Gwazda has was named the director and he's been very, very incredibly capably directing that trust uh, since then. And we've been working with him and with the trust on um, unearthing the work that was left in the studio and inventorying and decoding it and understanding it and you know, presenting it to uh, uh, the new sort of scholars, new curators who didn't know about it, and to um, also to those who knew her. But because of this quality in Sonia, where she was so hyper-focused on what was in front of her, on that ping pong table, on what was um, just, you know, she was thinking about and was coming up, she rarely talked about her past and about um, the, her previous projects and the, the trajectory of her career. So um, this unearthing, or kind of the archaeology of the studio became um, the way to, to witness the breadth and the depth of the work that she did over 65 years of um, of her career and to find sort of the threads in her work and to see sort of the repeated patterns to understand her methodology. So um, what you see on the left is um, Farley Gwazda and um, Terry and I and um, uh, uh, ben. ben who was, uh, was a um, curator who we invited for a studio visit at that time. So in the process of um, so this decoding of the Rappaport's major project became uh, somewhat a work that, that we've been involved with. And um, it's been endlessly fascinating. Um, it's been uh, challenging. It's been sort of fun. And uh, we never get enough of it. <laughs> And so the first um, project that we sort of unpacked was um, actually the last project that the Trappaport did, which was it was a series of 24 collages on the pages of New York Times called Yes or No. It was on view at uh, Crossword Gallery several months after Sonia's passing, and then it was subsequently acquired by Mills College Museum of Art, and we. Um, uh, did the first catalog that we did was kind of the decoding of this project, yes or no. Uh, and it was really a retrospective. It was her self-retrospective where you could see all the themes, the iconography that she uh, used for the last 35, 40 years of her life. So I just want to bring you quickly your attention to those hand gestures that are on the margins of one of this, the, the detail of this particular collage from, from the project. And you will see that these are the hand gestures that, that were also, uh, that, that um, uh, became a kind of a derivative of the Biorhythm project that's uh, now um, on view at the museum. Um, um, Terry, do you want to talk about this um, very important year, 1980? Sure, we can start um, with uh, this pocket calendar, um, which Sonia, you can see um, annotated, um, they were really symbolic notations of her biorhythm cycles. She became very interested in biorhythms. Um, it was sort of in the air at the time. Um, and so, um, a lot of women were buying, and actually not just women, women and men were buying biorhythm calculators, um, which you see one on the right. And um, what she did, she wanted to record her biorhythms. Um, and then, so she was working between this copy on her pocket calendar and then used a calculator that was, I think it's the exact same model as this one. Um, yeah, this was the one used during the 1980s to calculate biorhythm cycles. What she was trying to um, sort of was interested in was her physical, emotional, intellectual cycles, which um, are part of the calculate, 
calculations and you'll see them come up um, in other works that we'll get to momentarily. But it's interesting to compare it with her own um, notations, which she put in color on the left. Um, she used yellow, um, yellow, red, and blue um, to make certain um, calculations, which she would then translate into other works. So I want to add to, to this that this year, 1980, is, um, is also very significant because um, uh, just uh, recently, um, her mother passed away, which was kind of, uh, seems to be an event that was, um, had a lot of effect on her and on her work. So um, she, the, the, she went into a mode that was very retrospective. Um, Sonia turned, um, did she turn 16 that year? To, or she was 50, 50 she was in her late 50s. Her um, children were grown uh, at that time. Her mother passed away. She was like turned inward. Um, she was going through psychotherapy at this time. So the work that she started doing in 1979 and 1980 was very hyper-focused on sort of herself. Um, and um, in fact, in one of the, the, the pieces that came out of this um, uh, work a couple of years later, she calls this process um, a 20th century self-portrait. It's, it's another way of um, uh, portraying her creating a self-portrait, right, through um, um, a variety of means. So in parallel with keeping that biorhythm pocket calendar, she also, throughout 1980, um, created this, um, uh, worked on this uh, pictorial diaries. They were really collages. Uh, and every day of, uh, of the year represents a, a small collage. And those are, um, uh, there are little objects, there are cut out words, there are images. Um, and it really becomes a, became a record of her uh, very personal um, sort of processes, her life. It's about her family life. It's about her art life, because there are records of what she saw and what she was working on and uh, the development of her art, art projects and also kind of a social and political life. Um, uh, so there are three examples of this, right, in the exhibition uh, in San Jose, but there are, there are large wall size calendars and there are uh, 12 of them, right? So we're going to go to, um, to look at one of the days. Um, it's a detail on the left. And uh, so Terry, do you want to talk about this? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, what it's, it is interesting, one of the analogies that Al and I were talking about in preparing for this talk is how she started um, working, you, you see her leading up to this, um, sort of working with the material of her life to create um, her art. And she certainly um, was using, you know, all, all the different facets of her life in creating these collages on, on the calendar for a year. So this slide we're looking at right now, um, on, the, on the left, you see um, there's, a, there's a piece of um, computer paper and there's a, um, a, a small dresser on it. And on the right, you see this dresser, which was part of a project that she had embarked on just slightly before she began the biorhythm calendars called Objects on My Dresser. Objects on My Dresser was um, really the magnum opus piece of her, her career and um, sort of brings together so many facets, again, of her life. So you, you start to see consistency in how she um, began to work at the turn of 1980. Um, so the, the dresser here is a tansu chast that was actually um, her dresser. 
and she had 29 objects that had collected on top of her dresser. So going through this process of mourning the loss of her mother um, and sort of thinking about her life, um, there's many personal items on it. Um, at some of them are photographs, some are toys. Um, there's a cat you can see um, in the in kind of uh, in the very front, uh, which is a cat that um, her mother had given her and she made this statement, um, mother always hated cats. Um, so there were lots of curiosities for us to work with in, in deciphering um, the, um, the yes or no project, which then we see emerge with the biorhythm project, which is really the inception of this. Um, one of the things it seems like, I talked about the ping pong table a little bit, and what you begin to see is, just as she wanted to, sort of, sort of uh, it was a work in progress on top of that ping pong table, she's now got these objects, the 29 objects, which become that um, 3D ping pong table filled with things that she begins to work on to create um, a series which went from 1979 in, until that last work, yes or no, um, in 2015. She Not yes or no, but, the, but it doesn't matter. It went until 2015. Right, right. So she's creating systems of understanding for herself using the materials of her life. And it's very, very, um, just to add to this, it's very much based also on um, her um, psych work in psychoanalysis and so therefore a lot of associations between symbols and words and images and objects that are kind of networked um, kind of in a dream dream work uh, um, type way so um in the following year and this is unfortunately not a very high res image of it um after um working with the, creating the, the biorhythm chart and creating this pictorial diaries, uh, mapping every day uh, her emotional, psychological, and uh, intellectual sort of state in such great detail, um, uh, and learning to code um, at the same time. She um, uh, actually started, um, sort of created her own program, the biorhythm program, where she correlated what, how she should have been feeling based on the predictions of the biorhythm calculator and what her records, personal records indicated. And uh, so this is a, 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 a plot, a computer plot, but she apply, also draws on it and she you know, creates symbols. So it became um, uh, these printouts were later made uh, into um, kind of an artist book. It's like this accordion book, which is also on display at the museum. Um, and um, just for a comparison, this is what, you know, if you look up online, a kind of a biorhythm calculator, there are now not physical calculators, but there are apps and sort of programs. That's, you know, you, you could find one and create your own chart. This is what, uh, like a standard chart, sinus kind of, um, uh, uh, what do you call, sine wave um, of a biorhythm looks like. Um, uh, so, um, if in those couple, first couple of years, 1979, 80, and 81, 82, she was very, very still focused on herself and understanding her own state, assessing her, you know, like finding her own voice, finding her own sort of footing. Um, in 1983, with this perfect participatory performance that happened at uh, the Works Gallery in San Jose, uh, which was called Biorhythm. She opened the process up to include the viewers and the participants. So this was um, not only about assessing her own sort of state and comparing, making comparison, but it's collecting data from um, the visitors, from the participants. So Terry, because you, you were involved in a couple of this recreations, can you like walk us through what that looked like? Sure. Um, one of the things I wanted to say is that Sonia was um, devised this term. She, she was very interested in, as I think I said, in science. 
and um, sort of um, had her own relationship to it um, because her husband was an award-winning um, organic chemist who taught at UC Berkeley and all of her kids, her three kids, all became scientists. So she was very interested in ideas that um, related to science and applied the scientific method to creating her work. And she used this term to describe her work, which was quantifying qualitative information. So uh, as Allah was sort of another way to talk about the work before these uh, audience participatory pieces that is that it was centered Sonia was centered centering on quantifying her own qualitative information sort of the subjective um, uh, quantifying that to sort of um, make make sense of it um, and in 1983 um, you know when this work in San Jose was done she was working with um, software engineers and gallery visitors to correlate their personal assessments, assessments of their emotional state with um, their physical states. Um, you can see in the, in the bottom um, right, there's also a palm reader. She brought, brought a palm reader into this um, because she wanted to add, I mean, actually charting your biorhythms is not necessarily a scientific thing because you're using a calculator. You can buy them on Amazon.com now. Um, but you know, bringing in a palm reader brought in yet another way to you know, sort of quantify that qualitative information. And um, she was also very interested in people's words and gestures, and they became part of the work. Um, and this, this piece was brought into the, um, the um, 2020 uh, performance recreation at, at um, San Jose. And Allah's going to tell you a story about um, well reader right so um this this image is up from the amazing recreation of this performance that was so well attended and so amazingly sort of fun that uh was february 7th right was the opening of the exhibition and um since uh i think the idea was to recreate it as close to the original performance as possible so there were um uh, obtained, you know, the, the, the medical sort of hospital bracelets, which were used in the original performance. There were, um, when uh, in the original performance, the, the participants were photographed expressing themselves. They were recorded on audio. They had to record sort of in handwriting how they felt, uh, but they were also asked to express that in there with gestures, right? So in order to um, um, uh, uh, create some kind of a background for the for the hand, uh, a dentist bibs were used, um, uh, and there were Polaroid photographs that were preserved. So there was a lot of data that was sort of collected and preserved from these performances, and um, in this recreation of of course, a palm reader was necessary, so um, uh, it was quite an adventure that took about a month to um, find a, a palm reader in the Bay Area who would be willing to participate in a museum event and do this for how many hours did he have to perform? It was several hours uh, long. So luckily, um, uh, after many interviews uh, with um, uh, potential uh, readers, we found Sebastian Boswell, who um, was um, understood this completely because he um, performs himself quite a lot. And um, I think he ended up doing um, sort of, uh, a wonderful uh, job in this recreation uh, performance. So, um, we can, um, if anybody's interested <laughs> in their um, palms uh, read, we can recommend Sebastian Boswell. Um, so um, finally, uh, you could see that this, the, the data that was collected, you see the number that was on the, on the medical bracelet, you see this, um, participant wearing the bracelet, you see him wearing that dentist bib, you know, against which he was photographed. So the, the photographs um, then were collected 
uh, along with sort of the handwriting, along with the um, audio recordings. And in uh, 1984, um, the, this um, collected data was included in an exhibition uh, that traveled throughout the United States. It was called SFSF, San Francisco Science Fiction. Um, and the title of Sonia's installation was uh, so the computer says I feel right um, uh, so it included this images from the work San Jose performance as you see kind of pasted on that scroll and but it also included an audio recording uh, of participants talking about uh, their own sense of self-assessment I think what's really um, interesting is that the recording is periodically um, interrupted right, by um, a British accented male voice who with a kind of great gravitas and authority um, uh, says uh, that, but you should be, you know, tells the person how, he, how they should be feeling. So this is a kind of impersonation of the authority of the machine, of the authority of, you know, the calculator, the computer, the kind of the objective, the scientific, right, that somehow starts being in conflict with the very personal uh, assessment, with intuitive assessment, um, and uh, that conflict keeps growing in an interesting way from here on for uh, Rappaport's sort of future work. Because on the one hand, she really embraces technology, information technology, uh, computer technology. The last 10 or so years of her life, most of her work was done um, in the form of net art. It was web-based work. She uh, embraced the community of artists who were working in that, that sort of genre and um, with information technology and became really identified as a media artist, as sort of uh, uh, an, an artist who works with computers. And yet she, her doubting, you know, that her conflict with that, uh, the authority of the machine is um, is always there. It's you know the, she parodies um, the scientific method. She questions it at the same time. Um, she doesn't, um, and that's the tension that that runs through the rest of her work. But I think just to add to it, I think it's it's also very interesting to me that that voice on the recording is uh, this kind of British male voice um, that stands really at that point in contrast, like it's kind of this patriarchal sort of voice that um, it comes uh, how's that, in conflict with Rappaport developing at that very same time, her very personal voice as a feminist, as a woman artist, finding her own way, finding her own sort of methodologies, um, you know, painting her own self-portrait. Uh, and, um, um, and I think that that gives us kind of a clue to, to what happens in the next um, four decades of her, of her um, work. And so just Kind of Terry, do you just the final word on this? Sure, sure. Um, uh, you you kind of said it. I think that one of the important things to say about this is this this work really um, biorhythm and the um, in in Toto and the work beyond are also a significant self portrait that Sonia is creating of herself. Um, she's certainly involving other people and in a sense giving them. Um, uh, their own authority as subject because she uses their, um, they have their own words, they make their own gestures. Um, on the left is, you can see um, these um, images from Digital Mudra that she adapts for, that series began actually in 1987. 
and went on for about the next decade. Um, but anyway, those gestures that um, are superimposed over the subjects who were um, part of biorhythm, um, you know, come together in, in in this work, along with, you can see the comment, wonderful, it's my lucky number, and heat. So all of these elements come together as a kind of self-portrait of these people because they have chosen them or been assigned them and accepted them in some way. And I think that was a really important aspect of this work that going forward, she continued to do audience participatory work. She would involve a computer to um, always to um, do a, a kind of um, assessment um, um, that she would then pair um, with, you know, with the subjective, um, the stories and, and people's own assessments, um, allowing both to make choices that she would then have the authority to bring together. And I do also have to say, um, she was of a generation where not, um, not all women um, really emerged as feminists, but um, her work in the domestic sphere paired with her work in the, um, with technology and in the scientific um, realm really um, were um, are good um, indicators of her own feminist stance. Um, in this, um, from mid-century forward um, into the 21st century. And um, I think we can now go to um, the Q&A. We're gonna be here taking your questions and if you want to write them in on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, please feel free to submit them. Um, we have one here that asks about the significance of number 29 related to approximate days of the month, February, not in leap year or something else. Um, Emily, where did, wait, um, I'm not sure where that number, where you picked up the number 29. Terry, do you know where it could, could it have been? But it was not. Oh, it's actually um, 28. Object and the, the dress itself counts as 29. I don't think there is a significance to that. It's just what was there. She took stock of what was on that dresser. It happened to be uh, 28 objects and the dresser itself. Um, so I, I would venture to say that it's, it's you know, it, it just, it's coincidental. <laughs> We have another question asking, how do you think Sonia would have responded to our current situation, our shelter in place situation? Oh, I think she definitely would have responded um, very directly with that because um, her work throughout her career, certainly in her later career, became more political. She did a number of works that were based on current events. Um, the New York Times, which were the substrate of yes or no, was um, something that really was important to her. So she followed the news as well as advertising. Um, she was very interested in advertising images, but I think that she would have definitely been working with it. Um, certainly she would not have been pleased about it, but she would have also been working with it as material. She knew so many people. Um, she was very engaged in um, university life, not just at UC Berkeley, but um, she felt really comfortable and it was important to her. To, um, to talk with experts in fields, and she didn't ever hesitate to reach out to people. Um, she did work about um, you know, the nuclear crisis, she did um, work about war, she did work about many sociopolitical issues throughout her career, so I have no doubt she would be very involved in, in making work, interviewing people, goodness knows what. We have another question, which I'll answer, asking why doesn't the exhibit include more of Sonia's later work? Um, as Terry and Ola have mentioned, she worked until the end of her life. So the exhibition ends around 1984 with the end of the Biorhythm project. And she was working up through the end of her life very actively um, making work. This exhibition is not meant to be a retrospective, but really look at this 10 year time period where this major transition happened, where she moved from working in abstract painting to working with 
computer, new emerging computer technology. And for San Jose, it's particularly significant because we had an exhibition with her in 1974 of, that showed these paintings um, and these more abstract compositions. And San Jose Works Gallery presented her 1983 biorhythm performance. Um, to someone who doesn't know her, this trajectory of her work, to have seen something like that in 1974, and then the same artist's work in 83, um, that's you know, completely, completely different, uh, is, is pretty mind blowing. And I was really interested in tying that story together. Um, let's see, the next question asks about her last work involving um, the a poem and it says I'm wondering if Ola would want to expand her comments about the conflict parody doubt about the machine and the scientific method the tension running through her work would love to hear anyone's thoughts on this um hi Anne um well, if it wasn't um, a webinar and if you could talk, I would love for you to, <laughs> to talk too, because um, actually um, Anne, who is as Leslie Seltzer, who asked this question, was a collaborator with um, Sonia Rappaport on the very last project that Sonia did, which was the very last iteration of um, um, uh, the objects on my dresser that was um, another a kind of participatory uh, project um, and involved um, uh, words and images and objects. So it was kind of a mega collage as well. Um, the, um, in terms of um, the tension um, uh, in, in Sonia's work, um, um, well, I mean, it's, it's a kind of, um, I don't know if I really have time to address all of this. Terry, if you have like quick thought, um, about it and if you, um, care to offer that, um, with an example, cause I think it's kind of a long discussion. I think it is a long discussion. Um, since it's Anne, we could actually address it with you off screen another time. How about that? I think it's too much because um, we really have about three minutes left, I believe. I'll say from my perspective, I am um, somewhat new to Sonia's work and legacy. I started research on her about three years ago. Um, and something that really fascinates me about that tension that is evident in her work from those stencil paintings um, onto biorhythm and, and, and further, of course, is that it seems to predict a lot of the tension that we currently feel between um, our personal lives and, and technology. And to me gets it like, the fundamental questions of what it means to be human and um, the sort of anxiety that we feel around AI. And, you know, to have been able to anticipate that in 1973 is, is pretty incredible. And uh, those are important questions still today. Um, can I answer, um, Dina Rappaport had a question up here. Um, and Dina is actually, if, if, I, if it's the same Dina, is Sonia's granddaughter, um, who asked about um, how would Sonia feel about um, her work being reproduced. And I just wanted to say, Sonia loved doing that because she did it herself. And I think she would be thrilled. Um, during, uh, I um, co-curated two shows of her work um, while she was still with us and we reproduced her work and she brought in new audiences. Um, she really liked that very much. It, um, the work was never exactly the same. And she liked the idea of working with 
um, being current, working with the materials of the day, always. So um, as technologies changed, she embraced them. She was conversant with contemporary computers up to the, her, the time of her death in 2015. She always had an, um, a Mac that was current. Um, she knew how to program. She knew how to do a lot of things. And she knew how to bring in people to help her realize her work. She didn't hesitate to do that to bring in um, people who knew how to help her realize a very complex project. Um, we've been talking about her prescient intertwining of personal data and computers, 11 years before the PC and 40 years before Facebook. She seemed in constant dialogue, a negotiation between what was personal to her, like her own codes, and those of the scientific world, which dominated the lives of her family and the university, no? And I would agree, absolutely, she was in constant dialogue. And um, I don't know if, if Terry or Ola have anything to add. I'm happy to add to that. I mean, she, she lived in a family of scientists and she was very interested in the scientific method. I mean, her training at UC Berkeley with Earl Lauren involved a scientific method. He wrote a book called Says Allen's Composition. So she was trained. Um, in the in the 40s, the 1940s, using a scientific method to dissect composition. So there, it's no accident that being married to a scientist, having children all who became scientists, and she became engaged with science. It was very important to her. So I think that um, I think that she adapted science to her own ends. She also published the kind of thing in, in Leonardo that most scientists would not publish. She, she was adapting science and the scientific method from her perspective as an artist. So I think that she was negotiating the scientific world always through her own, her own vantage point. She wasn't competing with scientists. She wanted to be in conversation with them. Um, I would like to, uh, just above, there's a question from Teresa Bricker. Did she ever communicate or collaborate with other um, artists of the, of the time who also focused on personal emotions versus information, such as on Kawara. Um, and um, I'd say that this is uh, one of the sort of interesting things about Rappaport's career that we keep uncovering is um, how much aware she was of the contemporary art around her. And how, it, she did not necessarily collaborate uh, with other artists, but uh, she had a kind of a very broad awareness of the work. And so um, one of the, uh, I think, things that we, we do in our writing about her work um, is try to place it alongside the contemporary developments, like for instance, you know, the objects on my dresser, which is um, uh, the project that's about kind of mourning the loss of her mother in a way. Uh, we've compared it with Mary Kelly's um, postpartum, which was about kind of a relationship with a newborn son. Uh, so they, they, of which she was also aware, which is kind of a contemporaneous project. So, um, you know, I'm not sure if, how on Kawara, you know, how much she knew about, about his work, but, um, but in general, she, she had a lot of um, awareness of conceptual art and experimental practices uh, of the day. Absolutely. Well, I think that's the last question we can take as we are running over on time. Um, we're so thrilled that so many of you joined us here virtually for the talk. And thank you so much, Terry and Ala. It's, it's wonderful to hear your insights into um, Sonia's life beyond what one can find in a book. <laughs> um, so we'll wrap up there. And if we can answer these questions on the Q&A, if um, when we close this, we can still type them, we will do so. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Museum. It's been a pleasure.